All right. Welcome, all you hurly burlyites, back from holiday break. I want to get right to today's pod because I'm really fucking excited about it. We're debuting what's going to be a semi regular feature here on the hurly burly called The Chiefs. The Chiefs is a panel of three former chiefs of staff to some of Canada's most accomplished heads of government. And by semi regular, I mean this. It's whenever there are important enough issues to dive into, and maybe more to the point, whenever we can get these three very smart, very busy people to join us. Tim Murphy, former Chief of Staff to Paul Martin, now CEO and Managing Partner at Macmillan LLP. Ian Brody, first Chief of Staff to Stephen Harper and central to the founding of the CPC, now Professor of Political Science at the University of Calgary. And Brian Topp, former Chief of Staff to Rachel Notley in Alberta, Deputy Chief to Roy Romano in Saskatchewan and one of the architects of Jack Layton's Orange Wave federally. Today, he's a founding partner at GT and Company. Here's what the Chiefs is gonna be about today. It's a unique discussion of the major issues of the day from the unique and shared perspective of people who think about them not as campaigners do, i.e. what might be ideal in a political sense, but in the realm of what's actually possible to deliver in a governing sense. This is the intersection of politics and government. Today, for our first ever Chiefs discussion, three topics. The government's reliance on the consultant class and more specifically McKinsey, In the wake of Bill Morneau's book, Prime Ministers and Their Relationships or Non-Relationships with Their Cabinet Ministers. And finally, fighter jets, more specifically F-35 fighter jets and the government procurement process generally. Is it broken? And if it is, how do we fix it? Tim, Brian, and Ian, welcome to the Hurley Burley, you chiefs. Goddamn, I'm excited that you're all here. Thank you for doing this. Good to see you, Dave. Glad to be here. Tim, how'd you spend your time over the holidays? And where do we find you right now, in Toronto? Yeah, I'm in Toronto at uh, the law firm, although it does look like I'm on between two ferns, but we're uh, <laughs> in the studio at the place. I, uh, you know, hung around the, the city uh, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, someone had to be in the office during the holidays, so I had a, uh, a sedate break. Oh, no. Ian, anything more exciting for you? No, I was uh, close <laughs> to home uh, here in Calgary, and I'm, I'm, I'm back with my view of the biology building from the seventh floor of social science, my, my home for most of my adult life, I guess. Excellent. And Brian, where do we find you today? I am in the nation's capital, a fine place that is being heavily snowed up. <laughs> Love, what, you don't live there. What are you doing there? Yeah, I'm kind of hanging out here these days. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, listen. Before we get right into the media issues, there's a few general things I want to talk to you about while I've, while I've got you. I mean, the chief of staff is a political position. The people who hold it are partisans, people who want the government to get reelected. But the person is also in charge of a government with all the responsibilities and constraints that that entails. You were all partisans before becoming chiefs of staff. What's the biggest learning for you upon starting the position? Ian, maybe you start with you. Uh, I think that you know, I came to uh, chief of staff in government after having been chief of staff in the opposition benches. And, you know, for all of the challenges of making the transition to government, it is the whole objective of being in opposition, right, is to, is to win the election. You want to be in charge of uh, the public service. And it was, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, sometimes frustrating and exciting uh, to do the job. I think the pace of the of the pressures on a modern G7 government in the 21st century it's hard to understand for anybody from outside the 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 uh the circle it's hard to understand what the pressure of or the pace of decisions and of issues that arise and I mean I was lucky I was chief of staff in 2006 2007 we had a daily news cycle, but you remember when there was a daily news cycle and you could bring in people at, you know, five o'clock in the morning and they could go through the, the newspapers and the CBC and CTV and Radio Canada line up and figure out what the issues were going to be of the day. I mean, it seems so sedate back then uh, compared to uh, now. And yet at the time, it seemed it seemed insane. Mm. Tim, how about for you? What was the biggest learning yeah, I think when you there got are into three that things. Yeah, there are three things, and I agree with the in around pace, I, you know, because I'd come from being chief of staff to a finance minister, and so I used to say that we had, you know, 90 important decisions a year to make in finance, and we had 90 a day in the PMO, and it just is, 
it comes at you, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of issues from the sublime to the ridiculous. And one of the things you have to learn very quickly is actually you don't have time for all those issues. You've got to figure out the ones that matter today, but actually going to matter six months from now, six months from now and what you need to pay attention to. I think this, the second thing uh, was the degree to which you had to figure out a modus operandi with the senior levels of the public service. Um, it took a little while to make that work, uh, to, you know, cause they can be either in the way or your friend and you've gotta, you gotta come to some kind of deal with your bureaucracy, uh, frankly, to make that work. Um, and then I, I, I think the third was the degree to which you believe and everyone believes you've got an incredible amount of power and the degree to which that is not true, um, that you, you know, you can have influence. But at the end of the day, you know, there's three or four things you can move. But beyond that, your political capital starts to wane very quickly. So I think those were the, the three things that really were learnings for me through that process. Mm, interesting. And Brian? <clears throat> you know, a wise man once said to me, um, public services are really good at doing things, but not at figuring out what to do. And so that's, that's the job of the political leadership and the job of the premier's chief of staff is to make sure that the, the premier's view uh, is reflected in the discussions and that the political leadership doesn't get lost you know, lost in all those 90 issues that Tim was just talking about and keeps an eye on the ball, which is what are we going to get done here? And then to work through uh, that, that stream of issues that comes at you to get it done. Um, and so um, the challenge of the chief of staff job is to keep your focus um, because you're the only one, you're, the political leadership are the only ones who are going to provide it. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So there's a, a, a truism in politics that people say a lot, and it really fucking gets under my skin, but don't let that affect your answer to this question. Um, and that is <clears throat> that the people who got you elected aren't the people to govern. That uh, the people who are good at getting you into the job are not the people that are going to be good at helping you keep the job once you're in. That they're two very different skills campaigning and governing and so you shouldn't there's always criticism of leaders who bring their campaign team right into the pmo and and people talk about oh you know you need sober outside thought so as a campaigner i've always chafed against that notion but as people who have seen both sides of it what is your take on that brian let's stick with you <laughs> I've seen that argued. Um, I've seen it argued that, you know, there's one team that does the campaign, another team that runs the government. And I think it broke the team that uh, that uh, that was said to. Um, and I don't think it's reality. Right? The the truth of the matter is that the the political team has to, has to know, let me put it another way, in the Premier's office or the PMO, are the people who have to think for four years or in the uh, circumstance of a minority government for 18 to 24 months, um, how are we going to win the next election? So you need to be electorally driven when you are in the premier's office. And so in a perfect world, you have, you can do both of these things. You can, um, you can be providing the appropriate political advice in government with an eye on the campaign. All three of you know this very well. Um, and I, I don't know how you do that with two separate teams. Tim, I, I don't mean to put you in a difficult spot because you did bring the campaign team into the PMO and this criticism was leveled at that PMO, right? Yeah, it was. And I think, uh, so I, I agree with Brian, but I do think there is uh, one slight nuance and that is sometimes, and it really depends on the individuals more on the character of campaign versus government in my view, but there are, campaigns do tend to uh, attract and people succeed in that environment who respond to the immediate extremely effectively, who can see something coming today and drive everyone to get the answer and the response that limits it, mitigates it. To some degree in government, your responsibility is actually not to panic in the urgent, but to figure out what's important. Now, those are, those are talents in both contexts, but sometimes in government, you you know, you can let the story run because you know what? 
a month from now, people won't care and they won't notice and they won't remember. And, you, and overreacting in the context can drive you to a, a result, a conclusion, or a position that actually is harmful for you in the longer term. So I think that transition from, I need to get this fixed today, to, you know what, I can let that ride. Some people can make it from a campaign to a government perspective, and others are less capable. And I think the criticism that is fundamentally uh, that is the core of that uh, criticism is that difference. And I think, you know, we've had people who have have done that. I mean, one of my biggest fights with uh, Scott Reed, one of your regular guests, was exactly around that issue, who wanted actually me to go out and speak to the media. And I, I said that would be the worst possible thing because I am not talking when I don't know the answer. Um, and so I didn't. And I think at the end of the day, that was the right thing to do in that context. But that, for me is is the the core of that and the key mm-hmm. Ian, what's your take well when when i was doing this in 2006 uh, uh like uh, tim i guess uh, after the election we'd won with a with a minority and i think my assessment at that time and mr harper's assessment at that time was that we would be back to the polls very quickly we didn't expect the liberal party to have basically a 12 month leadership campaign we expected it would be shorter than that and so we'd be back to the polls quickly so that probably shaped some of the decisions. Uh, other than Doug Finley, who's our campaign manager, who had to stay running the campaign because we, as I say, we thought we'd be back quickly. I think we brought all the senior people from the campaign. Your your friend Jenny, uh, goodness knows, I wasn't going to move to government without uh, without Jenny Patrick. But I mean, we, we brought a bunch of people. That said, we also had to fill up the team with people who had some experience uh, in government, which most of us at that point uh, I didn't. And to understand, as Tim said, that kind of modus vivendi with uh, with the public service. Of course, it's a little bit different in Canada because you have a permanent public service, at least at the federal level, in in PCL, and you can make some changes in there. Mm. But there, no matter who you're changing, you're bringing in somebody who has some experience on the civil service side. So I don't see this. I think, I mean, goodness knows I got the same arguments that Tim, that Tim got, that Brian got, is that you need to ditch this entire team and bring in a whole new team of folks mm-hmm. who are around for the morning years and haven't been involved in a campaign since then or whatever. You know, that was my, that was the argument I got. And I don't think we suffered at all for having taken that with a pretty big, the pretty big grain of salt. Well, Mulroney's an interesting add, example. David, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Yeah. Dave, can I add one thing? Cause I, cause I think what that criticism though fails to understand, I think is, Actually, how important loyalty, cohesion, teamwork is to the core of people at the center of a government who arrive as part of the political group. And that is built, obviously, by running a campaign, by having some battles together. And the notion that you can just add someone who hasn't part of that, uh, it just doesn't work in my view. And, and, you know, there are points in government where every gun in the country feels like it's pointed right at you, at the, at your team, at the prime minister, the ministers, the government. And frankly, unless you've got a team and the loyalty and the trust among that group, it's very difficult to survive that kind of thing. And I think that's only built by having a group of people who have struggled together and won together. You can't just say, oh, we've got an expert and this person can come in and fix all of our problems. I think actually political history in this country shows that is not true. So Brian says, Brian, Brian says, you know, you need the, the political people to provide direction to a bureaucracy who are not good at telling you what your agenda ought to be. It seems to me the criticism, you brought up Mulroney, um, and in my political life, this is the formative example of this, where par- partway through his first team, he jettisoned all of his, quotes friends who had been in his office and brought in professionals headed by Derek Burney, a former public servant. And the criticism there, I guess, is that people are the, pl- the political people are too political and you need to bring in people who are less political to run a government. Brian, do you have any truck or trade with that? I think it was Mark Lenon who said, you know, the, the job of the political staff is to be politically driven and administratively sensitive, and the job of the public service is to be administratively driven and politically sensitive. I think that's true. And when we say we're politically driven, that's a layer cake, okay? A layer cake that has many elements in it, one of which is your party's strategy and your party's goals. That's politics. What are we, why did we get elected for? That's what I mean by you have to provide focus and keep pursuing it. And then there's a whole bunch of other issues, another layer being the daily calms chaos. Okay. And when people say 
the premier's office, the PMO is too political. What I think they usually, what they really mean is you have been consumed by comps and you are a weather vane that is, that is, that is being blown around and as leaves on the, on, on what's in the Globe and Mail that day and what's on CBC and the public could not care less at the end of the day, day by day. And so I, 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 I think in Mr. Maroney's case, you know, his issue was not, let me put this as nicely as I can. I, I don't think the issue was that he needed to get rid of quote unquote political people and bring in administrators. His problem was that he needed people who were less ethically challenged and focused on, um, let's say, distractions. And he needed people to do politics, to, 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 to be the political center of his government. And, you know, let's be clear, Mr. Maroney, ran a very politically focused and savvy government that got a lot done. We may not agree with what he was doing, but in a way that government is an example of what I mean. And uh, one of one of the his benefits, of course, was Mr. Mulroney was providing that himself. Um, but uh, he did need to change his team for sure because they were distracted by other things than their jobs. Yeah, and I want to be careful about you know, brought in Derek Bernie. It's true he brought in Derek from the from the Foreign Service, having worked with him on uh, on G eight summit and so forth. Derek's a friend of mine, and Derek was the head of our transition team, and in many ways, my coach on how to be a chief of staff, for which I'm extremely grateful. Derek may have been a very good public service and foreign service officer, but he was no slouch on the political side too. Almost, okay. a, uni- almost a unique character in that regard. I didn't know. I didn't know that part about him. Actually, it wasn't uh, that wasn't prominent when he was. Uh, that's not what they emphasized when they, when they brought him in. No, par- probably part of his skill. Yeah. <laughs> but I do. But it. But it is important. I think you know Brian's on to something because I think the other thing is, does the team reinforce your weaknesses or enhance your strengths? And I think a little bit of Mulroney's problem was he had a team around him. He was a consummate political guy reacted politically you know what was in the paper he you know he was that kind of guy and uh, unsurprisingly the campaign team and the people he brought with him were those kind of people too and my guess is inside there they created a a cauldron of people responding to what was happening on the in the headline back when they had them and uh and and what he really needed was someone not who wasn't political but someone who had a bit of distance from the day-to-day and i think that's that I think is important. And when I, you know, when I talk about chiefs of staff, I mean, you've, it's, it's not like there's a perfect job description for the role because you actually need to be a chief of staff to a person who's got the job and match, you know, and, and that is, a, there's a, a, an alchemy to that, frankly. There isn't like you can go look up in the, you know, go get a headhunter and here's the perfect chief of staff. It's a, it's a combination of skill sets that are responsive to the, the talent, abilities, weaknesses, and strengths of the person who holds the job. So here we are in the second week of January. I've just returned from a vacation in a climate where rum is pretty much considered a native crop. Glorious. Given those two factors, rum and time off, I've had an opportunity to do a little reflecting as we wind up our messaging on giving season from our presenting sponsor, TELUS. We talk a hell of a lot about it around this time of year, but giving isn't really a seasonal activity, eh? More of a year-round thing for all good people I know, and it's absolutely that way for TELUS. As I've talked about here before, giving is a core value with them, and it comes in thousands of forms, from major charitable programs and corporate donations to the countless hours of community service their people devote themselves to. The TELUS Future Foundation is a major example of how they live their values. It's an independent registered charity that believes all youth, regardless of circumstance, deserve an equal opportunity to reach their full potential. They launched it with a huge endowment in 2018 to support all admin costs for all time, so the foundation can direct every penny of every donation it receives to deserving local charities in Canada. Over 500 each year, providing different forms of education or health services, many of those enabled by technology. In 2022 alone, 548 individual grants, adding up to more than $10.5 million. Since inception, over $35 million in grants. The human impact of all this is, well, huge. Over 2 million youth in communities across the country are being helped. So happy January, Hurley Burleyites. You can always learn more, or if you're so inclined, give to the good works of the TELUS Friendly Future Foundation at FriendlyFuture.com. You know, so okay, so one of one of the assumptions of of this show and of the curse of politics is 
that people, the things don't happen, uh, uh, sometimes they do, but they most normally don't happen inadvertently and they don't happen because people inside government are stupid or don't see the obvious or are craven. They're smart people working very hard trying to do good things. So when things happen, there's generally a reason. And if it looks stupid, there's probably still a reason that isn't stupid for why things are happening. Which takes me to today's first topic, which is the reports this week about outsourcing to management consulting firms. And the reports were about the Trudeau government and McKinsey, but it also appeared that this was something that was happening at the provincial level across the country, uh, especially during COVID, a lot of outsourcing of strategy and planning and idea formation to, uh, to uh, management consultants. So, I mean, just to take a step back, I mean, when Trudeau was elected, the bureaucrats were holding rallies. Like, they were so excited about the return of what they considered to be government that would respect the public service and listen to the public service and work with the public service. Tim, how did we get to a place where uh, the government feels it needs to spend 70 million bucks on management consulting advice? Well, I think there's a, a bunch of streams to that answer. I mean, one of which I think you had that deliverology concept out of the UK, which seemed to have, you know, uh, some quote unquote smart people thought that there was some magic sauce in that and that, and that, you know, there was a way to deliver more effectively on the priorities of the government. And that had this deliverology label onto it. And where could we get some of that? Uh, and I, and you, you know, and frankly, you'll see McKinsey's got a, Part of its website has a deliverology page. Really? Um, okay. I also, I also think you know there was, there's a bit of a sense that you know there's an argument that going back to when Paul Martin you know made the big cuts he did in '95 that there was a, you know there was like fifteen thousand people left the public service and some of them are were very smart, intelligent people, and that attracting those people to the public service is more difficult, and you'll see every clerk of the Privy Council speaks to that. And so maybe the creativity of the ideas or the ability of that group to implement wasn't as strong as political leaders. And so where can we find that? Um, unquestionably, you look around the world, not just in Canada, you've got these management consultants out there saying, we can help you deliver better. Um, you know, and, and we've seen experiments all over the place in that kind of thing. So I think, and then all it needs, two things I think happen, one of which is as soon as you get one success with that, you know, it's, it's suddenly everyone wants to try it and it expands. And then I think the other thing that happened is, is COVID and the pandemic and that sweeping away the cobwebs of bureaucracy to get stuff done fast uh, was something governments really put a priority on. And how do we do that? And I think there was an outreach to, to kind of people out in the private sector. Maybe they can do this better. So I think all of those things contributed to a, you know, Maybe there's a group of experts we can pay way too much money to to help us do this. Ian? Well, I think there's two different pieces to this story, <laughs> David. There's a particular story of this prime minister and his senior people's attachment to the senior team at McKinsey. It's related to his, I think, early views about uh, Canada's potential relationship with China, uh, I, I'm, I'm not here to make any partisan points, so I'm not going to say it was delusional, but whatever. They sold him you know, a bill of goods about Canada-China relationship and balancing U.S. And this, I mean, this is a longstanding debate in Canadian politics, uh, which I'm on the, on the other side of. Um, so there's a particular issue with, with McKinsey where the government had at an early stage, I think, tried to outsource its uh, China foreign policy and its economic you know, it's sort of version of the McDonald Commission was this thing where McKinsey came in to try and put together an economic policy for the government uh, to follow. And, you know, whatever it is, it has been what it has been. I don't have a particular problem with government going outside of the civil service for advice and for help. You should always ask the civil servants first for their view. Uh, there's issues where the civil service has blind spots. There's issues in particular for the federal civil service where it's so uh, focused on Ottawa that you can miss uh, viewpoints from other parts of the country or from other sectors of the country. So you need people from outside. And look, 
uh, during the Second World War, uh, the liberals brought in, you know, dollar a year guys from the public, from the private sector to help run different aspects of the war effort. Nobody said, oh, my God, we're outsourcing to, you know, the private sector. We, we think of that as being a high point of government effectiveness is that they brought in people from all hands on deck. And since Pierre Trudeau's time, there's been constant stories about the prime minister doesn't respect the civil service, you know, that he had. He had no regard for the foreign service, so it was said. And then Mr. Marty and Mr. Kretchen had, you know, all these stories go on and on and on. Mr. Harper's stories are only the most recent in this, and then, and then Mr. Trudeau's. Um, uh, that said, uh, losing the core ability of the civil service to manage programs—that's a different story. Uh, the idea that uh, some of these management consulting companies have been brought in to manage sort of core programs of the federal government. I think that's very bad news for the for the civil service speaks to a, a degeneration of civil service ability to deliver on kind of uh, our, uh, our core services. And if that goes on, then that 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 is a worrisome that is a worrisome challenge. When my friend Jim uh, Prentice became uh, premier here before Brian was in the premier's office, uh, you know, I co-chaired his uh, panel on the future of the Alberta civil service because at the time he had found, as he said, I can pull levers and there's nothing attached. And that was the result of uh, of a of a multi year uh, pr problem in trying trying to generate an ability, at least at the center of government, to support the premier's direction of what the government was supposed to be achieving. And that that that, that was a very bad sign. I'm not sure that that the damage that's been done there has been entirely repaired either by Jim or by Brian's efforts or since then. Some of you might remember those hoary old high school math problems about trains. You know, one train is traveling west at 60 miles an hour and another train is traveling east at 45 miles per hour on the same track and the student has to calculate when they'll meet. Personally, I always wondered what happens when they meet, given that, you know, they're on the same track. Nothing good, I used to think. Anyway, as brilliant a student as I was, I didn't know much about trains. First, the math problem isn't theoretical. It's a real-life calculation that railroaders make every day. And not just once, there can be hundreds of trains on a network like CN's at any moment. And somebody has to figure out when all of them will meet. Second, of course, trains on the same track don't meet. They pass one another. And that's because of something called sidings. Think of sidings as the railroad version of the passing lanes that appear from time to time on a two-lane highway, like most of the Trans-Canada. A siding is a stretch of parallel track that allows a train to pull over and let another train whiz by. Back in the old, inefficient days when CN was a crown corporation, its sidings were only 6,000 feet long. Nowadays, the average CN train is twice that length, 12,000 feet, which has necessitated the construction of two-mile-long sidings across Canada and down to the Gulf of Mexico. That's cost a lot of money, but CN considers it an excellent investment and continues to build out its network, which has enabled CN's railroaders to plan passing points with tremendous accuracy which keeps the trains running smoothly and on time, which is the prime directive. Oh, about that math problem, here's what I always wanted to ask. If a steam train is moving at 60 miles per hour and wind is blowing from behind at 60 miles per hour, does the smoke from the smokestack go straight up? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? 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 Brian, when you went to, when you went to help Roy Romano, when you went to help Roy Romano, you had to transform the entire government. I mean, the thing was bankrupt and dysfunctional uh, in the ex in the extreme. And you were relying on the public service of the government that had existed before for eight or nine years. And in provincial politics, that matters more than federal politics uh, because there's less of a consistency to the public service. Uh, did you need to turn to outside consulting advice for how to transform that government or did you work with the officials you had? I'll answer that question and then I want to refer to something that Ian just said. Um, yeah. So look, when the Romano government came into office in Saskatchewan in 1991, the public service was a shambles um, and the previous government had, uh, had systematically gutted the senior public service and had gone through a long cycle of pretending to govern by putting the public service through constant reorganization cycles, uh, hired a number of people who were not appropriate in the public service and done many other bad deeds that ended up with uh, a bunch of them going to jail. Um, 
And we didn't adopt the uh, the quick fix of hiring management consultants. Um, I think um, uh, uh, working on basis of very good advice from former Premier Alan Blakeney that Premier Romano set out to rebuild the public service. And that started with hiring uh, deputy ministers who were competent in their jobs and then did a very slow, careful job of rebuilding the public service um, that, took, that took the better part of 10 years. And here's the thing. To his credit, when Premier Wall uh, eventually succeeded uh, Premier Calvert and and there was a change of government in Saskatchewan, Premier Wall did not go back to creating a shambles in the public service like the previous Conservative government under Mr. Devine had done. What Premier Wall said was, good news, you're all working for me now. And he basically picked up where the previous NDP government had left off. He saw that, that the public service had been rebuilt. And he just kept working with it. And the consequence was just there was the bulk of the senior officials who were actually nonpartisan uh, public servants now just went to work for Premier Wall. Right. Uh, let, me, let me just talk quickly about Alberta. When we talk about McKinley, I think it's very appropriate to uh, land on praising Jim Prentice. So Mr. Prentice saw that essentially the same thing had happened. This is my interpretation anyway, uh, with the public service in Alberta. Public service in Alberta was a shambles. It had gone through constant reorganization cycles. It had been gutted of its best people and of its policy and uh, ability, which is what Ian's referring to, its ability to respond to policy direction. The average tenure of the deputy ministers was something like 11 months. Um, and they were all hiding under their desks. They were, they, were, they were not prepared to make policy proposals because when you did, you got fired. Um, and there's a story to tell there about the chaos that had happened in that government and Mr. Prentice set out to fix it. And so he hired a very, very good clerk to head the public service um, and did some work that uh, Ian was involved in. And they set about doing essentially what Roy Romano had had to do in Saskatchewan, which is rebuild a functioning public service. And in part, having seen what Mr. Wall did when we got in there, um, we did what Mr. Wall did. We said to the public service who had been uh, put together under Mr. Prentice, you think we're going to fire you, but it is far, far worse than that. You're going to work for us now. <laughs> and, we're, um, and we're going to look for your best work, and we're going to respect you and keep your advice. Um, and, you know, they, they, they seem to find it a really interesting challenge. There hadn't been a change of government in that province for 43 years, although as a practical matter, there have been symbolic changes every month, a year or so. Uh, and I, I think, you know, whatever we think of the policy direction that we did, the public service rose to the challenge. And that, Mr. Prentice deserves a lot of praise for. And my point is, he did not hire management companies to do that. He just said about the core business of fixing the public service. And that is what you need to do. At the end of the day, there's no substitute for a high functioning, strong public service. And when you have that, then consultants can be interesting on rifle shot projects, okay, but not to run the government. Well, let me, uh, if I could add to Brian's comment here, but the, this is a slightly different example. So we were in opposition, and uh, uh, Tim, Tim was in the Prime Minister's office at that point. We were getting ready in case we won the election. Obviously, you have to make preparations for that. And there was an exercise, uh, Derek didn't run it, but it was run under the rubric of preparing for transition, a consultation about deputy ministers with our own MPs a handful of them who had seen them all at committee over the course of the years. The assessment of which deputy ministers do you think are capable and which deputy ministers do you think we should be we should be worried about? And after I'd been in Prime Minister's office for a year, I was going through some files and found this list. And I found that after a year, in fact, the ones that we liked in opposition were in fact the ones I was worried about as the Prime Minister's chief of staff. <laughs> and the ones that we thought were were, 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 were so terrible uh, in opposition were the ones that I absolutely depended upon as the chief of staff to get things done. And so, you know, it does depend on, you know, where you stand is is uh, is where you sit. I, I told that story at a civil service, you know, uh, planning retreat that I got invited to, and I think some of them were horrified. I said, I think that this is a, this is a testament to the skill of the, of the of the public service is that uh, you know I think my assessment it's a, you know one person's assessment mm-hmm. was that the the folks who did a good job for Mr. for Mr. Martin uh, and therefore upset us when we were in opposition uh, were the folks who did a good job for us when we were in government on the other side. Yeah, where did What's any of you run into the I limits? Can, David. Yeah, go ahead. 
Sorry, I was just going to say, too. So, uh, interesting take, and it goes back to Brian's quote of Romano about what you, whether, where the administrative and political talents fit. Some of the, like, the people we actually uh, thought were great in government uh, were very sensitive politically but administratively skilled. And, and interestingly enough, some of the best of that group were people who had been political staffers for Joe Clark and Jean Charest, uh, including the person who's the current clerk of the Privy Council, today. who helped us put together the health accord. And, and it's because uh, they were sensitive to the political realities, but understood the need to get things done. And, and it was, uh, and they were extraordinary in that, in that job. I mean, we did have some really high quality professional civil servants uh, in, in senior positions helping us get things done. I don't know what, I think there was a sense uh, when Trudeau took over the job that, you know, obviously the, the bureaucracy in the, had been ignored by Stephen Harper, whether that's true or not is, is a different issue. Um, and, and they felt, you know, an opportunity to celebrate. I think, you know, I do think there is, there were some ideas that the private sector had been extolling things like a greater engagement with China, this deliverology, et cetera that I think became bit flavors of the day and they felt they needed external advice to help them make that happen. I think at the end of the day, Brian is right though, we're best served by a competent, uh, engaged public service providing us uh, with what we need to provide it though. The one thing is um, we've seen mixed uh, abilities to deliver on the political priorities of the government of the day and the public service. And I think that's still something that needs to be fixed. You'll see in, a, you know, in Ontario, the Conservatives created and the Liberals kept infrastructure Ontario in the infrastructure context, which was because it succeeded as a reformed public agency in delivering infrastructure on time on budget in a slightly different model. So we shouldn't give up on an experimenting on the public service structure just because it's the way it is now doesn't mean we can't have a public service that has maybe some private sector incentives built into it. And I think, I don't think there's been enough experimentation in that. Where did any of you run into the limits of the competence of the public service to either provide advice or to execute where you felt there might be a need oh, for I some can, outside help? Oh, so I can tell you, well, like, as you know, David, we were, and then I think it got continued under Stephen Harper, we felt, for example, that our votes at the UN were insufficiently balanced between the Israel and Palestine, and that in particular, we voted fairly consistently with, uh, you know, the, the communities who were in favor of a Palestinian position. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with both uh, with our foreign affairs bureaucracy, who were in particular felt that there was a an interest in preserving our ability to talk to those people who voted, etc. But that but that we felt there needed to be a better recognition of Israel at that point as a democracy in the way we voted at the UN, and we could not get the foreign service to move. It actually finally took an aggressive effort of kind of going around them, including through the UN uh, ambassador, to get the votes we wanted done. And that's where the, the bureaucratic and political interest of the bureaucracy and ours uh, collided. And at the end of the day, we had to have a very uh, intentional effort to push them aside to get what we wanted done, done. Sure. Ian or Brian, either one of you got examples of where the public service couldn't deliver what you needed them to deliver? Go ahead, Ian, and then I have a couple. I have one story. I have nothing to add to what Tim said. <laughs> <laughs> I endorse Tim's views 100%. So, so just very quickly, when I was even even younger fellow um, and deputy chief of staff in Saskatchewan, I was put in charge of watching the government for watching the premier's office for two weeks in July. And basically the message I got from my boss was, you're watching the store. Don't do anything. And said, okay, got it. And um, my friends in the public service uh, understood that the, um, the responsible adult was on holiday and that the kid was, uh, was on the tiller. And so that was when they introduced the decision item saying the airplane that the cabinet has decided they have to buy must be bought this week 
or the seller is going to sell to somebody else, you have to act immediately or we will lose this opportunity. Like, Holy crap. And so I, I, I authorized it. And uh, when the adults showed back up from their holidays, they were like, you did what? Um, <laughs> I was an airplane for, uh, for years after that. And whenever, you know, a window would blow out or there would be problems with the landing gear, the DMs would come and talk to me and say, we'd like to tell you what your plane was like last night. Um, so in Alberta, <laughs> when I got there, um, I got it, started getting memos with red across the top saying, urgent action must happen today. Uh, this will be, all will be lost unless this is decided today. And I thought, okay, I've seen this before. Um, and so I would circle those memos and I would say, resubmit this in three weeks without this on it. And what I discovered was <laughs> then the papers would come back without that on it. Um, because this has been the tactic they were using in the chaos of our predecessors to try to force them to deal with things. And I just told them, you're not, you're not going to do that with me. I've, I've seen this one before. <laughs> uh, another... Uh, uh, another thing that was interesting about them was that their early drafts of memos would be, so here are your options. You could do this, or you could do this, or you could do this, or you could do this. Please let us know what you have in mind. And I, I, like, I was used to the Blakeney Douglas style with really clear recommendations from public services, from public servants. So I said, what? why are these notes like this? And they said, because that was the only way they could survive under previous regimes. If they made recommendations that the... Uh, powers that be didn't agree with, they get fired. That was why the average DM's tenure was 11 months. Um, and so we told them, no, we, we, we actually know what you want to recommend here. We're looking for your best advice. Um, and then we started getting it. And so that was an interesting look at the what happens when you uh, run reins of terror in the public service, when you don't care about the quality of their advice, that they will hide under their desks until, until things change. <laughs> My recollection say, is that David, Alex Himmelfarb never stopped having an opinion. No, he uh, he always no. had an opinion. But my yeah. interesting, my <laughs> two, I have two stories, and they all are about running up against the natural uh, conservatism of, and I mean that in small c sense of the public service. Um, you know, they don't want to use any political capital, personal capital, bureaucratic capital, unless they have to. And in part, that's their function, is that's the challenge function, as they call it. Uh, but, you know, for example, David, you remember we did the international policy statement under Paul. We were trying to, you know, do one for the first time in 10 years to kind of unify our theory of defense and aid and foreign affairs. And we would go out to each of the, the line departments and get back pablum because when they talked together, they rounded off every corner with the result that we got nothing uh, that had any cogency for us or matched what we were trying to do. So to get around them, as you recall, we had to hire a professor, Canadian, but a professor who was at Oxford to come and kind of sit Jennifer you know, Welsh. Uh, uh, above them uh, in, in that process. And so, you know, we see that time and time again in government where I think the biggest challenge in the political is you want something to go and they say, no, we are here for a challenge function. And we see that, you know, we we'll, may talk about it, but it, that's true in the procurement process too, right? Where their challenge function can absolutely get in the way of doing things quickly. And that's not to say challenge function is illegitimate. It is, but they will do everything they can not to use capital unless they're ultimately told to. All right. Okay. Let's move on to something that may be only of interest to me because I ran this by my Curse of Politics colleagues and they didn't seem to bite too much, but I'm interested in what your take is on this. So former finance minister Bill Morneau is out with a book and he's doing interviews about the book. I haven't read the book yet. Don't know if it's been formally released or not, but in fairness to Mr. Morneau, I'm not going by the official book. I'm going by media reports about the book and his interviews. But the thing I want to talk about is his relationship with the Prime Minister, which he describes as non-existent. Um, and that he had never been with the Prime Minister in the absence of staff, never had an opportunity to talk one-on-one, -on -one and hadn't developed any sense of relationship. This is not, now I understand that it's not as uncommon as I thought, but this is not the way I understood things growing up in politics. It's not the way I understand the elder Mr. Trudeau ran his government. It's certainly not the way Mr. Kretschmer and Mr. Martin ran their governments. Um, and I'm wondering, 
as people who've been there, who would be that staff person in the room, where there to be a staff person in the room, what you think about this type of arrangement and what you think the correct role between ministers, the head of government, and senior staff are. Somebody jump in. Well, look, the, I always tried to re- remind myself and remind staff that the staff aren't the elected officials, and so the decisions are ultimately made by people who are elected, right? That's why they're accountable to the public. It's sort of an essential element of democracy. I mean, it sounds like a political science lecture, and I guess I get paid to do that these days, but but I think there's an element, I mean, I think that's an important um, element to remember. So you should never have staff get in the way of the minister's relationship with the prime minister and uh, and vice versa. That said, uh, you know, Mr. Trudeau had a cabinet of 30 odd people or whatever, and he's got uh, part of a job to do himself. So the idea that ministers are going to regularly kind of sit around and shoot the shit with the prime minister for three or four hours one afternoon in some kind of casual, unstructured and one on one way is completely unrealistic. And anybody who thinks they're going to go into government and have that kind of relationship, I mean, I. Uh, 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 Ms. Uh, Selena Chavez, who was the Prime Minister's uh, parliamentary secretary at the beginning of the Trudeau government, left. You know, she said she would only never really got any time with the Prime Minister and blah, blah, blah. And like, what did she think she was like? What did she think she was going to? I'm not sure entirely what she thought the job of parliamentary secretary to the prime minister was, but the idea that she and the prime minister were going to sit down to have hours long discussions about the nature of structural racism in Canada, like, did she think that, you know, I have a different read of her uh, complaints about how she was treated by the powers that be in the Trudeau government. Look, it's tough. It's a big system. Um, the prime minister and, and senior staff have to, both in the political staff and the civil service staff, have to set up a system for making decisions, which doesn't depend on, you know, the prime minister sitting down for three hours to hash through something with every minister, you know, once a day, because there's only 24 hours in the day. I remember Himmelfarbe, we took over, he was clerk of the Privy Council at that time. He said, uh, look, are there some issues the Prime Minister never wants to hear about? And I said, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. And he said, well, like fisheries, does the Prime Minister have anything he wants to worry about fisheries? Because we can set up a system where you know, there'll be a minister of fisheries and oceans, they'll make some good decisions, um, we'll check to make sure that everything's fine, there'll be a cabinet process, whatever that, but the Prime Minister doesn't have to spend a lot of time worried about fisheries and oceans. Can you give me a list of four or five things the Prime Minister is really worried about? And we'll build a civil service and a decision-making process around that. And the rest of it, we'll kind of, you know, make sure that that doesn't get in the way of doing the top four or five things. Finance minister is a different situation. And um, again, I haven't read the book. Uh, I've seen some of the interviews. Um, I didn't get the sense from the interviews that Mr. Morneau had reflected much on, on his shortcomings as a minister. Uh, which I, I think is always the first the first step here. And I think, you know, maybe the he and the Prime Minister were on different pages about what the fiscal and economic policy of the government should be. Uh, if that was the case, um, you know, I don't know Mr. Morneau, I've, not, I've never met him. Uh, if that was the case, then resigning and doing something else with his life was, was the right answer. Brian, what do you think? Well, I think two things. First of all, um, there has been a long, long running debate about the tendencies of the Westminster government system, which I may say so continually shows its strengths compared to the alternative south of our border. But nevertheless, a tendency of this Westminster system to uh, morph into a kind of elective dictatorship in which the first minister and their folks call all the shots, have all the agency and basically turn their cabinet colleagues and their caucus colleagues into, and their party into kind of um, supporting caste, if you will. And so the, the question of agency in government, in this system of government is one that when you are in these jobs, you're the chief of staff, you are, you are in the premier's office, you actually should think about that how, how shall I not do things so that other people can. Um, and in this way, you know, Mr. Murnau is, you know, talking about a, a problem with the system. That said, all ministers measure how they're doing by how much face time they have with the first minister. And they are never happy with that. And they always want to be in the loop. And they want to, quote unquote, be consulted, which is another way of saying, when I say things, I want them to be what happens. And when it turns out that they don't have the skills, which is what Ian is gently trying to say, to maneuver in this system, and they feel that they 
aren't having an impact and they eventually bail out of the government and then write books complaining about it, but they discover a hard truth. And the hard truth is that maybe 5% of Canadians know who this man is and nobody cares about his crime. Maybe. Right? Mm. And um, that, that if you can't hack it in the system, then find something else to do. Um, and it's you know interesting to read about it and to, to, to think about it, but at the end of the day, it's a little bit on the minister as well that he wasn't able um, to, to, to prevail in his policy arguments inside the government. Look, this, the story I tell whenever I get asked about this type of question, I mean, not related to Morneau, but in general about ministers and prime ministers. We had campaigned, Tim will remember, uh, on preserving the income trust tax uh, structure for Canadian business organization uh, versus incorporation as a, as a corporation. Um, we'd taken a very high profile position during the election on this. We were in a minority government at that time. And I remember the day that Jim Flaherty, the finance minister at the time, walked in and said, I have to see the prime minister urgently. We'll make the arrangement for it. And he said, prime minister, we have to renege on our promise to protect income trust. And here's why, and here's how we're going to do it. And here's how I'd like to go about it. And so on and so forth. The prime minister looked like he had swallowed a porcupine and, uh, and he said, okay, that's a skillful finance minister. Okay. We made a high profile promise. He comes in a couple months later. I think we got elected in January. He came in in October and said, cause we announced it on, uh, on Halloween evening. Mm -hmm. Um, said, sorry, Prime Minister, this big promise you made out during the election campaign, we're going to have to break that promise. And after some momentary indigestion, that's what we did. I don't get the sense that that's, that, that was Bill Morneau's skill set. And that's okay. You know, he had a successful career as the executive chairman of his family's firm that his dad built up. That's great. Um, you know, the prime minister now has a finance minister. I mean, I, it's not that I agree with the government's fiscal position. I don't, um, uh, you know, it won't surprise you. Uh, but, uh, but the prime minister is entitled to a finance minister to, who, who can serve him in that way. And I, I, you know, I think Mr. Trudeau's found one. Can I just ask you a dumb question? Aren't ministers supposed to be powerful people? Aren't they supposed to be influent? Aren't they supposed to have independent power in their own right? Oh, but you gotta um, earn it. They gotta okay. earn it. You gotta earn it, David. I mean, look, that's I. I a couple of things. One of which I look at the three people who the government has lost, kind of a high profile perspective. Philpot, Raybould, and Morneau, all brand new to politics, right? So they, um, you know, they, they didn't quite understand how the game was played, and then they tried to learn in the job, and I don't think they liked it. Um, secondly, my view, you know, there is the second most important job in government is the finance minister, and it requires the kind of skills that Ian's been speaking to. And that is, you know, and you, you earn that on the job, you earn that by campaigning. Sometimes you earn it by sitting in, you know, in the House of Commons before you're appointed to the job. But I think it's, you know, uh, but I think what Bill Marneau never did was earn the credibility in the broader community that allowed him to go in to tell the prime minister something. And that credibility is earned in a couple of ways. You can have an independent political base in the party, like Paul Martin did for Jean Chrétien, to some degree how Flaherty had it for Harper. But you can also do it sometimes, I think, for me, I look at a finance minister in the federal government, and I think at some point you have to be seen publicly to say no to the prime minister and say no to your own bureaucracy. That builds up your independent authority to be able to be an independent force out in the party, the broader community, the economic public. Um, and I can't think of an example where Bill Murnau did that. Um, and that kind of, you know, so you've got to put a little risk into your decision making to earn the authority you're speaking to as a minister, right? At the end of the day, a government's built around four or five people who deliver and 20 people who stay out of trouble. Look, and Tim's, Tim, I think, has put his finger on, he's polite about it, but let me drive the nail a little bit harder. We have a prime minister who appointed an awful lot of senior people to his cabinet who <coughs> got elected to politics for the first time as a liberal candidate in 2014 or 2015 and got elected to public office for the first time in 2015. And 10 days or whatever it was, 14 days later, they're the minister of whatever. And that's a tough situation. 
taking somebody who's brand new to politics. I mean, brand new to politics. I don't care what they did before in their lives. It's, you know, great. They were had success in some other field. That's fantastic. I'm not trying to denigrate that. But they show up in politics for the very first. It's like the day the hockey player gets drafted. You put them on the you know the first line and the uh, you know on the forward line of your uh, abs there, um, and expect them. You know, well, let's get to the Stanley Cup Finals. Hold hmm. on a minute here. You know, Mr. Trudeau appointed an awful lot of people for his own reasons. He wanted to cut a different type of politics and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm you know the premise is entitled to appoint the cabinet he wants. Um, that the 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 implication of that though, which I don't think. Mr. Trudeau's transition team really helped him way through. He's appointing an awful lot of people who are brand new to politics, and that is going to create problems, including people who think, now that I'm the minister of whatever, you know, I should sit down for three hours and lecture the prime minister about, you know, how he should run this area of public policy that I'm now suddenly in charge of and was, you know, hadn't spent that much time thinking about until 14 days ago. That's on the prime minister and his advisors. Yeah, I mean, this is sometimes inevitable. I think, for example, the Dotley government that expanded from, you know, a caucus of four to a caucus of over 50. And so there was right. no choice. Um, you, and, and this was, you know, almost endemic when you have a big, a big win. Um, there's another piece of the puzzle here, though, which is, look, and um, Tim and David, you'll both, you know, I think, um, tweak to this, you know, the the pre the premier the first minister the first minister and the finance minister have to be a team they have to be aligned because basically the finance minister is the one defender of the treasury against twenty or thirty spenders and his only leverage is going to be uh, that he has the most powerful ally in the room and that's the first minister and one of the issues with Mr. Murdo appears to be that he wanted the government to run a more conservative if you will or a more austerity focused fiscal policy than the prime minister wanted. And the prime minister and the finance minister were not aligned. And in those circumstances, there can only be one end. Um, and and Mr. Murdo was, you know, attributing, um, you know, a bit of malice to the prime minister. But at the end of the day, he just they're not a fit together. And um, the prime minister ended up with the finance minister, who does appear to be a closer fit. But Brian, does he even know? Does he even know who disagreed with him? Like, if I go back to Turner's resignation from Trudeau, he didn't have a dispute with Jim Coots. He didn't feel that Jim Coots didn't support his uh, uh, fiscal policy or have his back. And he didn't resign to Jim Coots. He had a relationship with Pierre Trudeau, and he didn't think Pierre Trudeau backed him, and he resigned to Pierre Trudeau. You know, Jim Coots was as powerful a chief of staff as you'll meet, but I don't think that Morneau ever got a chance to find out what Trudeau thought. I don't know. Don't you make, actually make my point, which is that Trudeau and Turner were not aligned. Mr. Turner wanted a more austerity than Mr. Trudeau did. Yeah. Never mind that uh, that uh, ultimately the Trudeau government did go down the road of austerity. And in a way, that's the situation here. Mr. Murdo wasn't comfortable with all the measures that the Trudeau government took to respond to the COVID crisis. So they, so then he has to go. But you know, it is true that this prime minister does seem to have a modus operandi in which he wants most of the issues to be hashed out by his team before he engages. That is true. But the that does seem to be the style of this government. And that is, you know, in a very complex government, um, one way to do business. You know, Ross the boss in, in Saskatchewan, you'll remember well from your Saskatchewan background, David, he did everything himself. Okay. If you wanted wanted to know uh, do any kind of business with the government, you had to go talk to the premier. There are other premiers, Alan Blakey, for example, who absolutely did not do business that way and who, who wanted to be there at the close of the issues and, and on the most important issues and expected other matters to be you know, litigated and adjudicated uh, in a system in which, in which power was kind of more distributed. And that is very much what and this to be fair, yeah. And to be fair, uh, David, um, Paul didn't uh, submit his resignation to uh, Gretchen directly either. <laughs> no. Someday you'll tell us the history of what happened. <laughs> <laughs> a, little more, a little more public than that. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's, get, let's get some popcorn. Okay, tell us all about it, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's Next a whole episode. separate show. That's Next a whole episode. separate show, and we're out of time. In fact, we're out of time for procurement. So we'll have to come back to that. Right. We'll have to come back to that on another day. I don't want to The try good to news, just... David, is there'll be another story in two weeks' time that we'll 
trigger all the same <laughs> yeah, issues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, there'll always be a procurement story for sure. And I don't want to try to jam that into five minutes. Listen, three of you, I have loved this conversation. Thank you. This is exactly what I wanted this segment to be. I can't wait to round wrangle the three of you back up and uh, and get back at this again. And, and thanks for taking time on your busy lives to do it. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. I'd also like to thank everybody who listened or watched this show on, uh, on YouTube. And of course, thanks to my three distinguished uh, guests. And we'll see you next week with more of the Hurley Burley. Take care. Mm-hmm.